typically uh, these, these courses, uh, this uh, conference is for kind of incoming graduate students. Um, I think that is largely the case now, although because it's virtual, uh, we also have the ability to include other folks. Um, so does anyone want to just chime in where, uh, you know, what kind of degree program you're entering into? Yeah, I can start. Um, I'm an incoming graduate student. Um, my field of study is physics. Uh, and I'm currently in, uh, at home in Pasadena, California. Very good. Well, not too far. When, when the day comes, you can come here. Okay, so I'm in, my name is Greg. I'm in the uh, joint MBA, MS in Environment and Resources, and just moved into campus a couple days ago. So <laughs> calling in from Escondido Village. I'm Haley, <laughs> and I'm a first year PhD student in electrical engineering. I'm currently at home in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but I hope to move to Stanford soon, maybe in the quarter or two. <laughs> right. I'm Luke. Um, I'm a first year master's student in the Aero Astro Department, um, and I'm currently crashing with a friend of Berkeley until I move in on Friday. Um, I'm Richard Randall. I'm a first year PhD student in mechanical engineering and I moved down to Stanford two days ago and I still have no furniture. <laughs> so I'm sitting on the floor. My, uh, my name is Josh. Um, I'll be a master's student in the civil and environmental engineering department uh, focusing on atmosphere and energy. Um, and I'll be moving to, uh, to near campus uh, late next week and I'm excited to get started. I, I guess I'll go next. Hey, my name's Ali. I, um, I'm actually in a interdisciplinary humanities program called Modern Thought and Literature and know very little about energy, but I thought this would be a good experience. Um, and it seems to be like a, a very defining conflict of our time. Um, so I'm, I actually just moved in yesterday and still, it's still a little chaotic here and unpacking, but I'm I'm talking to you live from Palo Alto now. Wonderful. Well, welcome. Uh, it's any consolation, my background is in English, so I, I warm to the sound of uh, modern thought and literature, but it's, it's great. We love getting a sort of uh, diverse perspectives across, you know, the very technical to the more kind of cultural and so forth. I can go next. Um, kind of to break the trend a little bit, I'm a rising sophomore uh, and earth systems major. Well, the nice thing is if you make some friends this week, uh, then, you know, if you're ever considering uh, future directions to take, then you can uh, have a bunch of friends to ask what, what it's like. Um, so, yeah, I guess I will, without further ado, just introduce our actual speaker, not me who's taking up all the airtime right now. Uh, so, Roland Horn, uh, you can see somewhere on your screen, hopefully, and uh, we'll be sharing his screen shortly. Um, but he's a, the Thomas Davies Barrow Professor of Earth Sciences at Stanford University and a senior fellow at the Precourt Institute for Energy, which is uh, the institute running this uh, event that you're part of. Uh, he's best known for his work in well test interpretation, and I've now lost my introduction, sorry. Um, uh, production optimization and analysis of fractured reservoirs. Uh, he's an honorary member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers and a member of the US National Academy of Engineering. He's also served on the International Geothermal Association Board and was its president from 2010 to 2013. And there's a whole list of awards that I will not run through, but we're very uh, honored and pleased to have him here to share his expertise with all of us. Thank you very much. Very good. So thank you, Sarah, and welcome. Good morning, everybody. Congratulations on waking up so early. You should be able to see my screen currently. Is that what you see? Good. All right. So I'm going to talk about geothermal energy, which has actually been the focus of my career for a very long time. And for those of you in the Western states, you may or may not be familiar with geothermal energy, in spite of the fact it actually produces a significant fraction of our energy uh, here in California and actually also Nevada and a couple of other states as well. Um, I'm going to talk mostly today about geothermal energy because in fact, surprisingly, a lot of people don't quite understand what it is. We all know what solar and wind is about, um, but geothermal is kind of underground as an energy source, underground because that's where it is, and underground because a lot of people never heard of it. I'm sure most of you have, 
uh, but perhaps are not as familiar with it as I hope you will be in a few minutes. So this is what <clears throat> I plan to talk about today, where we are, um, how we use geothermal energy, and I'll finish up saying what we do with geothermal energy at Stanford. So during your lifetime, starting in about 2005, 15 years ago, um, tremendous increase in renewable energies, uh, not only in, in the United States, which is what this graph shows, but around the world. But I showed this graph in particular, it's now 10 years old already, but um, to point out the fact that the old style of renewable energy, which was generally hydropower, has actually been declining in the United States as well as in quite a number of other places. Um, there's some good reasons for that, which we'll talk about uh, during today, because I want to put geothermal in the context of renewable energy in general. Um, in spite of the growth that we've seen in renewable energy, what much further than we saw until 2010, um, renewable energies come in different flavors. And you see in this particular graph, a distinction between most of the renewable sources that we use today, uh, nowadays principally wind and solar, and geothermal and biomass. The principle being that geothermal and biomass are not intermittent. They can work 24-7 um, and therefore they have a place to fill in a portfolio of energy which actually can replace some of the fossil fuel generation that we hope to get rid of. Um, in addition to that, um, geothermal is in terms of its life cycle a very low carbon source. In fact, it's one of the lowest, uh, only slightly um, behind wind. Uh, you might ask, you know, why does solar PV have a carbon footprint at all? Because it doesn't produce any carbon, but actually it's quite a lot of carbon produced in the manufacture uh, and implementation of solar PVs. Um, and geothermal is growing. Uh, we have every five years a World Geothermal Congress, and one of the functions of that Congress is to actually make an inventory of the world's geothermal resources. We were supposed to have one in 2020, but it's postponed until 2021. So these are the figures from 2015. Um, and you can see the growth of geothermal energy production worldwide now, both in terms of megawatts installed as well as gigawatt hours actually generated, which is uh, perhaps a more definitive number. Uh, and the projection in 2015 was that we would be at around 20 gigawatts by 2020. And if we look at a more recent picture, you can see worldwide the growth of geothermal energy in the various countries of the world. Uh, and in particular, there are some which are growing at a tremendous rate. So I've pointed out um, the more significant ones there, uh, Indonesia, Turkey, and up the top there in Kenya uh, have more than doubled. In the case of Turkey, they went from around 15 megawatts to more than 1,000 megawatts over the past 10 years. So they have a very, very significant rate of growth. Um, these, these, uh, th this uh, set of graphs here is in actually numerical order. The United States there at the bottom, you see is kind of stable, but actually we are number one in the world in terms of the production of geothermal electricity. Second is Indonesia, just recently overtook uh, the Philippines. Um, and then just putting the, the graph, the same graph in a slightly different context, you can see the rate of growth in uh, Kenya, Turkey, and Indonesia. And importantly, that growth is not just from the last 10 years, but is continuing now. Um, so you can see the amounts in orange that have been added over the, the, the one year in which this total was taken. Now, let's come a bit closer to home. Um, I'm going to show you three or four snapshots of electricity generation in the Western states and importantly, California. Um, so in 2010, 10 years ago, uh, geothermal energy, this is all production of electricity in California. 28% um, or 30% almost was renewable. Um, one of the things that we need to take account of is whether or not to include hydro. 
hydro is clearly a renewable energy source, but legislatively, hydroelectric power is not counted as renewable. Uh, and the reasons for that are hidden in politics. But anyway, I'll include it here for the moment. But anyway, 6% of all electricity in the state of California was generated from geothermal. And importantly also too, 6% of the electricity in the state of Nevada is also, was also generated from geothermal in 2010. Um, and you can see at that time, 10 years ago, geothermal exceeded wind and solar by a substantial fraction um, and was only in fact exceeded by hydro. If we move forward into, let me just back up a second. Hydro, let me ask you to remember this number. 2010, um, hydroelectric power generated 33,000 gigawatt hours over the course of the year. So remember that number, 33,000. Um, move forward to 2013, you can see um, geothermal still generating 12,000. Uh, you can see by this time, uh, wind actually had crept up and exceeded geothermal in 2013. Take a look at hydro. Hydro dropped from, from 33,000 to 23,000. And those of you who live in California will know why uh, we have had uh, long periods of drought, um, which last sometimes for multiple years. And that's significant to the conversation we're having because Although wind and solar are cyclic on a daily basis, sun goes down every day, hydro is cyclic also. In the state of California, it's on a sort of cycle of about five to seven years. It goes up and down as well. Jump forward to 2015, geothermal still 6% of uh, generation in California. You'll notice now though that uh, wind has uh, stayed about the same and solar moved to the front. So the big expansion of renewable energy in the state of California, uh, solar thermal and solar, solar PV. This, by the way, is not rooftop solar. This is uh, utility scale solar. Uh, you'll also notice that um, about half of the electricity generated in California comes from natural gas. And then this is the last, the most recent numbers I have to show you. Um, I should point out here, hydro there in 2015, 13,000 gigawatts, 33, 23, 13. So running out of water in a hurry in California. 2017, um, it rained again. So hydro went back up to 43. So that shows how variable that is. Geothermal still at 6% in California and most importantly, 9% in the state of Nevada. And that's a very significant number, not only in terms of its growth, uh, but because Nevada in general has relatively modest quality resources. So here in California, we're, bled, we're, we're blessed with high temperature resources of the order uh, 200, 250 degrees centigrade. Um, Nevada has rather modestly temperatured resources around 140, 150 degrees centigrade. So the fact that they're able to grow actually is significant in terms of the technological um, advance that it represents. Uh, you'll also see too uh, the significant part now played at least in 2017 by solar. Wind has remained about the same since uh, 2013. And it's still about the same as geothermal. Um, so that's sort of looking at the yearly scale. Let's take a look at the daily scale. This is one particular day in the life of California. And if you've never encountered this website, I highly recommend it to you, uh, californiaiso.com. And the California ISO is the people who dispatch the power around the state of California. And at any particular moment, you can see how much electricity is being generated and consumed. You can also see where all of that energy is actually sourced from. So this is a, about lunchtime around this time of year, um, last year or the year before. You can see on the right side, the, the renewable uh, sources. And you'll notice on the left side, 44% of the electricity that day in California was being generated from 
renewable resources, not including uh, large hydro. And if we look at that same day, actually this is the previous day, we can see um, nonetheless how it changes over the course of the day. So in particular, uh, the, salt, the sun is pretty reliable, comes up and goes down much the same time of the day. And uh, except in weather like this, it shines strongly in the middle of the day. So an interesting aspect of wind and solar in the state of California, which is true in quite many places, is that the wind is more prominently blowing at night. And of course the sun shines during the day. So wind and, and solar actually have a symbiotic kind of relationship that fills in the gaps of the day. Um, geothermal, you notice, rather boringly, stays lock steady the whole of the day. And for that's actually one of the natures of geothermal power plants. It isn't easy to switch a geothermal power plant on and off. Um, the same is true of nuclear. Uh, they, they work best if they're running all of the time. Um, and that's the way that you see them running. It's not evident in this particular graph, but actually over the past um, five to seven years or so, we have so much solar in the state of California that the geothermal operators have actually began to regulate their production just a little bit. It's not easy to do technically. They're not designed to be operated that way, uh, but they are now tending to throttle the geothermal power plants during the middle of the day because actually they get paid more if they have some kind of throttling capacity because it helps the ISO to control the grid. And you will notice uh, that particular day, the uh, state of California was generating 45% of its electricity from renewables, not including hydro. So you've seen this graph I'm sure before also, it's the so-called duck curve which shows the 24 hours of the day from midnight back to midnight. And what's classified here as the net demand is the electricity that the California ISO has to find um, outside of wind and solar. And in the middle of the day, it's a very small amount, a modest amount, this graph doesn't go to zero. But most importantly, during the afternoon from about uh, four o'clock up till about seven o'clock, the California ISO has to magically find a very, very large amount of electricity generation, about 13 gigawatts on that particular day. So that is a very significant uh, logistic and technical challenge for our electricity market. Um, and it has changed everything in the way that the electricity market now works in the last 10 years. So although Geothermal and nuclear used to be so proud that we were such a strong baseload power source. It seems like a good thing that's not intermittent. However, that's no longer true. Um, baseload power is kind of a nuisance because you can't get rid of it in the middle of the day. Uh, nuclear and geothermal can't be shut off and that means they have to do a lot of manipulation of um, distribution in the middle of the day. And most importantly, neither nuclear nor geothermal are so-called fast ramping. You can't switch on 13 gigawatts of power if your sources are solar and geothermal. That electricity principally comes from uh, natural gas. It's one of the reasons for the prominence of natural gas is that we have to have these fast ramping plants in order to be dispatchable in the afternoon. And those of you who happen to be interested in study and research in energy, um, finding renewable sources of fast ramping power or storage uh, are two of the prominent research questions which we face today. Now, in order to meet some of those difficulties in the grid, what we are seeing is an increasing um, introduction of battery storage into the electrical grid. And I don't know what our installation is today, but it's of orders of hundreds of megawatts in the state of California. And you might imagine that, you know, we charge the batteries in the daytime with our solar energy, 
and we discharge them at night when the sun is not shining. That, however, at the moment at least, is not true. You can see in this graph how the batteries are used, or at least on that particular day, how they were used in order to regulate the electrical demand of the state. And importantly, what you see is that the battery storage was charging and discharging um, sort of almost continuously during the day, on and off, at very, very um, high frequency. They're on for 10 minutes and off for 30 minutes, things like that. Um, typically nowadays, at the moment, the battery storage that is implemented on utility scale is principally made up of kind of so-called salvage batteries. If you ever wonder what happens to Tesla batteries when people wear them out, this is where they go. They go into big boxes in, uh, attached to the grid, and they're not particularly good for electric cars because they don't hold a charge very well anymore. However, they can hold a charge for 30 minutes or actually probably several hours uh, and be useful to regulate the grid in the way that you see. And this is a very significant um, growth area in both technology and uh, commercial implementation, battery storage, and actually other kinds of storage too. Now, um, the challenge for us in geothermal, I'm gonna talk about geothermal now because that's what you're here to hear about, um, is to how to fit into a, a dispatchable power market. And we're beginning to see now in the world uh, the implementation of dispatchable geothermal power. And here is an example actually from Hawaii, the Pune geothermal plant. The Hawaii grid, of course, is very particular because the islands are isolated from each other. Each of them is a so-called island grid, and therefore it isn't easy to move electricity from place to place. Each individual power plant has to be dispatchable because they can't throw power away. So uh, Puna plant, this one particular plant, is rather famous in the geothermal world community for having the ability to regulate itself. Um, the way it actually does that, by the way, is kind of low tech. They more or less have a bypass from the, um, past the power plant so that they can actually take the hot water from the ground. Instead of taking it through the plant, they just put it back in the ground again. It isn't wasted because, of course, that hot water is still there in the ground to use uh, later on. Um, my original home country in New Zealand has an even more significant fraction of geothermal energy, um, as well as renewable power. New Zealand is more than 80% electricity from, geothermal, from uh, renewable sources and around 20% from um, geothermal. Uh, Iceland is another famous geothermal country. And importantly, this is not just electricity now, this is all primary energy, including transportation, um, cars and trucks, and importantly in Iceland also um, boats, fishing boats. And what you can see there is that two thirds of the primary energy of the nation of Iceland comes from uh, geothermal. They also have a decent amount of hydro as well. Um, and let me switch to Japan, some of the other countries. Uh, Japan lives around the Pacific so-called Ring of Fire. It's also a geothermal nation like the Philippines, New Zealand, and Indonesia, and California too. Um, and you can see here that uh, Japan has had a history very similar to uh, the, uh, California in terms of renewable energy from uh, wind and solar. Turns out solar is a more suitable resource in Japan because the wind is very variable. It doesn't blow sort of uh, continuously the way it tends to do in California. But the, Japan has geothermal too. And in fact, geothermal was one of, Japan was one of the earliest nations to make use of geothermal in the 1970s, as was California too. And despite the fact that you see there, uh, geothermal is a very small uh, fraction of the renewable energy in Japan. There are particular places where geothermal is very important. You see them actually listed there, uh, the, those four prefectures. The red bars represent the fraction or the piece of their geothermal energy, which uh, piece of their renewable energy, which comes from geothermal. 
Um, technically, from the point of view of research, we are seeing innovation in the geothermal industry in, in the form of understanding of the subsurface, first of all, that's the geological part of the, of the technology, that's really the part that I work in, as well as in the surface technology, the um, design of power plants uh, and surface equipment. So this particular plant that I have a photo of here, which is in New Zealand, represents a kind of a modern implementation of the many plants that we have all around the world in, in, in terms of its, the complexity of its cycle. So this is known, what is known as a combined cycle plant. And what you can see here in the, in the center of the picture, the middle here, that building, square building, um, contains a steam turbine. And unusually, uh, it has a much higher pressure than geothermal turbines normally do, principally because the, the inlet pressure of the turbine is governed by the resource itself. <coughs> which are generally quite modest in temperature. I mentioned before, um, many of the, the resources in the state of California have a resource temperature of around 250 degrees centigrade. Now, that sounds hot. However, if you compare that to a, a fossil fuel steam plant or a nuclear steam plant, which typically have supercritical steam cycles, they have uh, steam temperatures of which can be 600 or 800 degrees centigrade. So the consequence of that is that geothermal turbines uh, tend to be very big, first of all, uh, which makes them expensive in terms of steel because the volume of the steam is much greater at lower pressure and temperature. Uh, and secondly, their efficiency is, is less uh, because of the lower pressure. It doesn't matter so much because the fuel, of course, is basically free. It comes out of the ground. Um, nonetheless, uh, that's, that low pressure is one of their characteristics. This particular plant is built on a, on a field, which is called Rotokawa, which has a, a very high temperature. It's around 300 degrees centigrade and therefore high pressure. So they elevated the pressure of the turbine um, to around uh, 25 atmospheres. Typical geothermal turbines are five to eight atmosphere pressure, something like that. But what's interesting and important about this combined cycle plant is that the exhaust from the turbine runs into a binary plant. So all of these kind of uh, fans that you see in the background actually are the cooling towers for the binary plants. The binary plants themselves are actually in the front, these small boxes. They're out in the open. Um, a binary plant is like a heat pump, basically. It has a closed cycle, which, which has turbines typically of uh, either pentane or isobutane. They heat the pentane to make a vapor. The pentane vapor goes through the pentane turbine and then is cooled in those air draft cooling towers. Uh, they don't discharge any um, water to the atmosphere the way the steam plant does, because of course they're working with pentane. Uh, but that combined cycle, taking the exhaust from the steam turbine through the burnt binary plant, allows that plant to have a very high efficiency. And we classify the efficiency in terms of the steam consumption per kilowatt hour generated. So Rotokawa has a steam consumption of about five kilograms per kilowatt hour, and that compares to eight to 10 kilograms per kilowatt hour on some of the uh, older plants that we have in California. So it's almost twice as efficient. Um, I might mention, I don't have a picture to show you, but the, the binary plant that you see there is, actually I do have a picture, it's coming up here, this one. Um, this is a binary plant in Nevada, doesn't have, it's not a combined cycle, it doesn't have a steam plant uh, attached to it at all. Uh, binary plants are pervasive in the state of Nevada because their resource temperature is so much lower. The steam plant basically would not be um, effective or it'd be too expensive. 
So what's interesting about this particular plant, this is a place called Stillwater, uh, is it's a, it's a hybrid of a different kind. In this case, they've hybridized solar with geothermal. Uh, and one of the characteristics of a binary plant, because it uses air-cooled uh, condensers for the power station, it's least effective in the middle of the afternoon, three or four o'clock, when it's hot and the sun is shining. So the geothermal plant actually has its lowest output in the late afternoon. Uh, and that, of course, is the time of the day when a solar plant has its highest output. So given that they occupy a certain amount of land for the geothermal plant, they, in this case, you can see have added solar PVs. The two plants are not connected except electrically. So they kind of backfill their output in the afternoon. One, when the demand is highest, and two, when the geothermal plant's output is at its lowest. Uh, and this particular plant is interesting in a second way, is that they do in fact have a genuine hybrid where they've added solar thermal, where the, uh, the parabolic troughs are actually heating the binary fluid and actually they're adding kilojoules into the binary plant itself. So in that case, they're actually a combined cycle, solar, and, solar thermal and geothermal. So in, I will finish in a few minutes. Let me talk about a different aspect of uh, geothermal energy, which is direct use. Uh, and there are many that you see listed there. Uh, if we look at the energy use of the United States, uh, and most importantly, the temperature at which it is used, you can see there the tallest bar, uh, most of the thermal energy that we use for space heating, water heating, air conditioning, etc., is actually at modest temperature. 40 to 50 degrees centigrade. Currently, most of the houses in the state of California that need heating, space heating and water heating, do it with natural gas, which certainly for one has a carbon footprint. And number two, thermodynamically makes no sense whatsoever. Natural gas flame around a thousand degrees centigrade. Why make a thousand degree flame to heat your house to um, 20 degrees centigrade in the winter. It, it's a very, takes a high quality resource for a low quality requirement. But 40 to 60 degrees centigrade is in fact the temperature that uh, many geothermal resources are available. We have geothermal hot water at 40 degrees 60 centigrade almost everywhere if you drill down to a modest depth. And if we look at direct uses of geothermal energy, we can see that they are very, uh, widely dispersed in, in many applications. And furthermore, they're increasing. This graph rather strangely goes from right to left. But you can see the rate of increases of all of those different applications. Most importantly, the one on the left, number one, geothermal heat pumps, which are used pervasively all around the world, even because they don't require high temperatures. And if we look at the countries of the world which make use of direct geothermal heat, uh, the United States is also prominent on that list as well, although we actually fall behind China. Uh, and you can see here some kind of non-traditional, non-volcanic regions like Norway and Germany, which have a great deal, and Sweden, have a great many applications of geothermal heat pumps. And I don't imagine you have the opportunity to see this right now. Uh, the, the energy week that you're part of normally takes a tour of SESI, which is our um, energy system on campus, which has three of the world's largest heat pumps. Uh, this is one of them that you see right there. Uh, and what SESI does is to take uh, waste heat from returning from buildings and switch it from the returning cold water supply back to the hot water supply. And that allows us to have one of the most, one of the most efficient heating and ventilation systems uh, in the world. The interesting thing about SESI, I'm sure you'll hear lectures about SESI, even if you don't get to see it this week, is that over the course of the year, the heating requirement and the cooling requirement of the campus in terms of gigawatt hours uh, is about the same. The area above the blue area and the red areas are more or less equal in size. So we are recycling 
kilojoules from heat to cool and back the other way. The problem, of course, is that during the course of the year, uh, in the summertime, we have too much heat. So we have to dissipate that part which is in the bright blue in the summer in cooling towers. Uh, that, of course, is an intentional, a cooling tower is a device constructed with a specific purpose of wasting energy, just throws it into the atmosphere. And the bright red part in the wintertime is the excess heating requirement, uh, which we have to fulfill for the campus, which at the moment is met with natural gas. So phase two of SESI, not yet implemented, is to take away the blue and the red and actually implement a geothermal ground source system. You can see a map of the campus there. And the plan is to install 26 wells, which take the water out from the ground, run it through SESI in the summertime for cooling, put it back in the ground warmer than it came out. And then because of the thermal capacity of the ground, we can recover that, th that heat in the wintertime and use it in place of natural gas. Uh, and if, if or when that system is implemented, um, we'll actually be able to have a carbon-free uh, heating and ventilation system for the campus. We won't have to use the cooling towers in the summertime the way we do now. And here is a geothermal well, if you like to see one. Uh, this is Panama Street, not far from the building that you would be in normally for Energy Week. Um, this is one of three test wells that was drilled on campus a few years ago in design of that system. Okay, so let me just draw this to a close. Uh, looking at the overall geothermal world, both in electrical use and direct use of geothermal energy, in terms of the avoided oil consumption, if we specify it in barrels of oil equivalent, uh, 239 million barrels of oil and the avoidance of 32 million tons of CO2. It's about three days of the current world's oil consumption. Not a massive amount, but anyway, an amount which makes a significant difference. Um, so what you've seen here, a big expansion of geothermal energy in the last 10 years, although it's been going for more than 50, a lot of new technologies have been implemented um, over that time. Lower resource uh, states like Nevada are now being recovered because of those advances in technology. And in the future, we have a technology known as EGS or Enhanced Geothermal Systems in which the reservoir is actually stimulated to make resources in places which don't currently have them or at least don't have, have the the, the quality of resource which we currently need uh, to generate electricity or heat. So let me close with this picture of the uh, geothermal research group at Stanford, Stanford Geothermal Program. You can see some of our members here uh, is a research program in the Energy Resources Engineering Department where I live. Um, it's existed for since 1970, more or less, so a long period of time. Uh, and we typically have um, six to eight students researching in that program. The general focus of the research of the PhD students and master's students in that program are associated with the subsurface. We're interested in how water and steam flow in fractured rocks. Most geothermal systems are found in volcanics and therefore they differ rather uh, in rather interesting ways from oil and gas recovery, which are typically found in sedimentary rocks. Um, so here's some other pictures of our group. That was actually the World Geothermal Congress in 2015. So with that, let me stop and invite your questions. This picture, by the way, is at the Geysers Geothermal Field here in California. It's the world's largest uh, geothermal field uh, and it generates about four percent of California's electricity by itself. Uh, thank you for the lecture, really appreciate it. I'm, uh, I'm dying to know um, <clears throat> why is it that uh, we as a society have shifted towards solar and wind, which is an intermittent resource, 
and is the same economically uh, speaking um, as geothermal. And have, I'm expecting a huge effort to change the grid in order to compensate that, which seems like a huge amount of effort. Why are we doing that rather than just relying on naturally non-intermittent sources such as geothermal, especially geothermal because it doesn't have many of the negative consequences that uh, nuclear imposes. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. <clears throat> so let me go back to the beginning of your question. One of the unfortunate um, facts about geothermal is it, it is more expensive than wind and solar. Um, and, it, and it is so for a number of reasons I'll come to in a moment. Ballpark figures, um, geothermal in California is six to eight cents per kilowatt hour, whereas wind and solar are now down almost two to four cents a kilowatt hour in some circumstances. So the proliferation of cheap uh, solar PV panels over the last 10 years is largely responsible for the huge expansion that you see in terms of solar. Um, you're, you're right that the intermittency is an issue and actually it's an issue not only for the grid but it's also now an issue for the solar generators as well because even if um, even if you implement you know a 50 megawatt solar plant if you can't sell your 50 megawatts because the grid is saturated with solar then you're you're basically you're doubling your cost if you're going to sell half of it you're doubling the cost of what you paid for as opposed to running it all of the time. Um, another issue with wind and solar is simply the time that it takes to actually deploy a project. So you can order up, you know, 10 megawatts of uh, solar panels from China and you can buy yourself a bit of land close to an electrical hookup you can probably build a solar plant in a couple of years, uh, including the licensing, everything else. The difficulty with geothermal, which in fact is one of the reasons for the focus of the research we do at Stanford, is the geological uncertainty. It's deep below the ground. It's um, you know 5,000 to 10,000 feet down, and understanding exactly what is there is not so easy, and it's also expensive. We have geoscientific methods for doing uh, exploration for geothermal, but in the end, we, we have to drill wells and they cost a lot of money, about $10 million each. So you drill a well, $10 million, um, maybe there is a suitable geothermal resource there or maybe there isn't. And that risk cost is what eventually translates into the uh, ultimate cost of the electricity. There are places, uh, Philippines, for example, where the geothermal energy is much less expensive than in California, mostly because of the quality of their resources and the cost of deployment and construction of a power station. But you're right, if we could um, improve our ability to assess the underground resource, we could actually deploy geothermal to a much larger extent. And one of the hopes for geothermal is EGS, enhanced geothermal systems, where we would imagine that we don't have to have such perfect geological conditions. If, they, if it, we drill and don't find a reservoir, we make our own reservoir by fracturing the rock. As long as it's hot, um, we're still good. And that's the current direction of geothermal research, actually uh, US-wide enhanced geothermal systems. So, sorry, as a quick, as a quick follow up then, um, and then I, I, I want to let other people ask questions. Um, as a quick follow up, so in terms of the future direction of geothermal, would you say, uh, because I wrote it down, uh, your quote was baseload power is now a nuisance. Um, so would you say that even if um, geothermal technology improves to the point where it is now less expensive in solar and wind. Do you think by that point, the grid would have shifted to a point where uh, baseload power is no longer desired and it's completely restructured? Um, I, I don't think we're ever going to go back 
So I think the grid is going to be the way it is now, at least for the foreseeable future. And that's why storage is so important. Um, it's interesting to me looking at the history of the grid in California. When they built um, Diablo Canyon, is that its name? The nuclear plant, the second nuclear plant in California. Um, when they built that in the 1970s, it's a 1000 megawatt uh, plant. They also built a pumped storage uh, system, pumping water uphill, because they knew that having a thousand megawatts that they couldn't switch off. There's also a second thousand at San Onofre nuclear plant, which is now shut down. Because they had that 2000 megawatts that they load uh, supply that they couldn't get rid of, they installed pump storage at that time, specifically to, to, to fill that uh, issue of the baseload power. So storage has always been an important part of regulating the grid when you have large uh, baseload resources that you can't um, you can't regulate easily. So that's why I said before that storage, I think, is the future growth area for electrical grids, California and I think everywhere. Probably batteries, but perhaps something else. All of you uh, may indeed come up with other creative ideas. We do have, Thank you. we continue to have pump storage in California too, as well as in other places. Okay, we have just a couple minutes left, but Luke has had his hand raised. So um, if you want to throw your question in, I think that'll be our last thing. Sure. Uh, thank you for the talk, Dr. Horn. Um, so coming from an aerospace background, I mainly find geothermal en energy interesting from its potential application to future settlements on, uh, future human settlements on extraterrestrial environments like Mars. And I was reading, um, particularly in Forbes, um, someone's est someone estimated that 20 years after humans first arrive on Mars, we could have geothermal energy plants set up. And I was wondering if with your experience and, and your opinion, that was actually a feasible estimate or if that was extremely over overzealous and over enthusiastic. Um, I don't know what the geological conditions are like on Mars. The, the kind of um, geothermal resources like the one that you see in this picture um, may or may not exist on Mars. It requires volcanism and high temperature heat. However, low temperature geothermal resources almost certainly exist on Mars in that you know, because Mars has a day-night cycle, the air and the ground will be at different temperatures. And anytime you have a different temperature, you can move energy from one to the other and capture some of it in the process. That's uh, that's the way that SESI works with uh, heat pumps. So by, by drilling modestly, wells of modest depth into the subsurface of Mars, you could move heat from the atmosphere to the subsurface. Um, whether or not there's sufficient water to do that, not that water has to be the, the, the carrier mechanism, but water is the cheapest and easiest, at least on Earth. Uh, you need some sort of some sort of carrier fluid to transport the energy around, um, but it's certainly a feasible technology 